Hello, welcome to Emotional Badass, where Moxie meets Mindful. I'm your host, Nikki Eisenhower, life coach and psychotherapist. And on today's episode, I'm giving tips for highly sensitive people dating. Dating is risky, y'all. It is an intentional gamble of energy, of vulnerability, of our hearts. Best case scenario is that we catch a keeper, a life love. Worst case scenario is we might catch a low empathy, low insight, low maturity, low personal responsibility, or low effort to grow, low willingness to work on self, energy vampire. If you, like me, have a lot of players in your family system that fit this description or might even fit full-blown narcissism or sociopathy, the sad, unfortunate truth that I strongly encourage you to deal with is that the most destructive personalities for us are what we have been programmed to be attracted to when we come from a dysfunctional family. We have all either been this person ourselves or known the person who seems to date the same person with the same struggles in relationship after relationship after relationship in ways that you'd think after a certain point would defy the odds of nature or the laws of chance. But it's not chance. It's our psychology. Our psychology is changeable. It really is. If we acknowledge and learn to deal with our own histories and grow past dysfunctional histories, dysfunctional psychology that we were taught, that we soaked up, our psychology is repeatable when we choose. And whether we know we are choosing or not, every moment holds choice. But if we choose to not deal, we will likely be in a Repetitive psychological pattern that does not serve us, that has us attracted to people that don't serve us, and creates a dynamic where people are attracted to us, where we won't serve them. As complex as attraction is in the human condition, because it is very complex. It's about the present moment. It's about the past. It's about what we've experienced. It's about our programming from society, about our DNA, so many things. I promise you that you have the power to change who and what you are attracted to and who and what you attract. The real tricky part about dating is how much of it is subconscious. It has always fascinated me to consider how the subconscious mind is at play in the day-to-day minutia of life, of our patterns, particularly in these realms of attraction. I want to offer today two types of tips that I have for you around dating. This is about short-term and long-term. So these are the two types of tips. What you do moment-to-moment in the short-term becomes a new way of being in the long term. It's just as true that what we don't do moment to moment in the short term becomes a new way of being in the long term as much as what we do do in the short term, moment to moment, becoming a new way of being in the long term. This idea helped me to be in integrity on my own healing path. And I offer it to you as I offer it to my clients and you, my podcast listeners. It is a boiling down both of my degrees in psychology and counseling and all of my professional and personal experience. This belief, this idea, this reality that every moment, and I do mean every single moment, I am not exaggerating. Because we are never without our psychology. Every moment a human being is either practicing an old pattern or is practicing a potential new pattern. In every moment, we are either walking towards sameness 
or we're walking towards newness and difference. Coming out of a dysfunctional childhood, we are either practicing dysfunction taught in the family that brings us closer to dis-ease, or we are practicing an intentional functionality that brings us closer to wellness and to peace. So here is an overarching dating tip I have beyond short-term and long-term. Allow yourself to be in a season of confidence building. So many highly sensitive people are frightened as if faking till they make it, allowing themselves to practice new stuff means that they're inauthentic and they somehow want to feel an authenticity with brand new things in a way that it just doesn't work that way, y'all. A bit of fake it till you make it is not only okay, it's essential. You are the only person that can give yourself this permission to try new things, and that feels vulnerable. It's part of why we need the permission to fake it till we make it, to practice into newness by letting go of what's old and no longer serving us. So here is the first tip. Get out of your head. Get out of your head as a survivor or a highly sensitive person or both. This is a practice of presence. Dating is not a job interview. Dating is an experience to see how energies jive. Dating is like a tennis match. Two players showing up to see if those two players have what it takes to send the ball back and forth and back and forth and back and forth so that they can play the game of tennis or the experience of dating. It is a tennis match or it is a dance. Think about a dancer. Dancers learn the steps through their mind as they get into their bodies to practice those steps. So dancers learn the steps in their mind, and then they very deliberately get out of their heads and into their bodies. They learn to trust what they've practiced from their mind and give in to the experience of their body. They learn to trust in that practice so that clean, crisp, powerful techniques of movement are practiced and then letting go of the mind to trust their bodies, their muscle memory in their bodies. And as they get out of their head to let the body do its thing, they dance. A dancer or a performer, two in the head instead of in the body and the experience of the dance will falter, will flounder, will misstep. Because dance is in the body and dance is the body's thing. It's not the mind's thing. And at a point, the mind has limitations if given too much power in the moment of wanting to dance. Dating is not a head game in a similar way. And it's a shocker, I know, to some of you who think it's exactly right and smart to be in the head for the entirety of a date or a dating experience. A lot of people confuse dating and interrogation mode, confuse dating and job interview mode. A lot of people date giving a lot of power to hypervigilance that only developed out of dysfunction in the first place. In hypervigilance, it's like we are constantly waiting for red flags to wave. A hypervigilant body and mind will not dance well, and it won't date well. And I know if you are currently hypervigilant about not dating an energy vampire in particular, then I just might have freaked you out. I might have freaked out your hypervigilant part. I can hear the collective hypervigilance responding to me as if to say, but Nikki, my people picker has been jacked up. It has made some massive mistakes. Trust me, it is right and smart to be really hypervigilant. Hypervigilance is smart. It's how I keep myself safe. It's how I stay on the ball. It's how I stay alert. It's the best dating tool I've got. What do you mean it's not a wise tool to bring on a date? 
I know that it makes people very anxious to even consider the idea of putting down hypervigilance when hypervigilance is the thing that got us through our trauma and got us all the way to here. I know, sweet hypervigilant parts that are listening to me right now, that you are just trying so hard to not ever get hurt again, to never be betrayed, to never have the type of depression, that type of betrayal brought on. I know it seems smart, but just like the dancer, if thinking makes the dance clunky and awkward because thinking holds the body back, makes it stutter in its dance, then too much thinking and on-guardedness, which essentially is holding a heavy shield, makes dating clunky and awkward too. Your job on a date is to be in your body so that your gut can give you input different than the mind's overthinking, anxious hypervigilance. This is nuanced work. It's okay to be frustrated with it. Just work through it until your mind and body work out the nuance that I'm naming. The truth is that hypervigilance doesn't keep bad things from happening to us, y'all. And if it did, I would be tooting the horn of hypervigilance and encouraging it, but it just doesn't. And you don't need to believe me. Look at your own life. Bad things happen to good people. And bad things happen, hard things happen, because having struggle and contrast in this human experience is part of the gig. It's part of how we grow strong resiliency muscles. It is the stuff of life. Every human being since the beginning of our human time has had strife and struggle and contrast. And we are no different just because we have gotten to a modern era. You, me, none of us, we could never be hypervigilant enough to keep bad things from happening. I want you to consider that you can deal with hard things and you don't have to see them coming in the way that hypervigilance thinks is so right and smart. You can deal with whatever comes as it comes even when you don't want, and even when and if it hurts. I wonder how much energy your body would have to be present on something like a date so that you can get the intuitive gut information that will really help you take care of yourself the way hypervigilance wants, but sometimes accidentally gets in the way of because we can't live in experience if we're holding so much heavy shielding. I want you to be able to show up on a date and show yourself and experience the energy of the person you were on a date with more so than experiencing the weight of that shield. I don't want you showing up and sharing hypervigilant language or energy because that is not who you are and it is not a fair representation of yourself, not a representation of yourself for your own inner child to see, and not a fair representation of yourself for the person you're on that date with to experience. You are so much more than hypervigilance and anxiety and tiredness. So if dating tip number one is get out of your head, I want to encourage you to learn what that means, the nuance of it, how to do it. And to try it till you practice into more presence and peace, which will showcase your personality, your spirit, the essence of who you really are over your nerves, your fears, and your historic traumas. I don't even want to call this number two. I want to call it like 1B if that was 1A. I want you to hold space for yourself to understand energy. I know that sounds woo-woo. And not very concrete. Just follow me for a minute and let's see if I can make sense of what I mean by understand energy. I especially see highly sensitive women. I see highly sensitive men do this too. But especially highly sensitive women seem to deeply confuse intuition and anxiety, particularly in the dating department. I want to encourage you to deeply 
and intentionally open to the process of learning the difference between intuition and anxiety. This kind of learning, your relationship to your own intuition, it parallels a yogic teaching I learned many, many years ago about the lifting of the veils of disillusionment. We gain clarity. Those veils of disillusionment, it's the idea that we are covered. We can't possibly have all the clarity. We are growing into it. We are finding samadhi or enlightenment. That's why people meditate. We gain clarity lifting one veil at a time. Imagine having lots of veils of lace, layers of lace over our face. Each veil lifted brings more and more clarity. Our perfectionist inside of us wants all of the veils of disillusionment lifted all at once. Damn it, right now, just lift up those veils. But it's like coming out of the dark and the sun blinding us. We can't really see everything when we're coming out of the dark. We learn slowly so we can adjust, so we can acclimate, so we can integrate new information, new ways of being, much like our eyes adjusting to bright sun after darkness. It's a process to learn the difference between intuition and anxiety. Simply start by asking yourself with curiosity and kindness, hmm, I wonder if this is anxiety or intuition. Where is this thought? Where is this feeling coming from? Hmm. Can you feel the curiosity in my voice, in my energy? A hint is that our intuition is never wrong. Though our interpretation of our intuition may be, and that's exactly what and where we are learning. We become better interpreters as we better learn the language our intuition speaks, just as we would become better interpreters and gain understanding as we spent more and more time with any language. Here's the next tip. Know your patterns to break your patterns. You getting to know your own patterns with great intention is an act of self-love. I had to boldly look at my own dating patterns. Things like I wouldn't speak up. I would go with the flow more than I really wanted to in my younger dating because I was still a people pleaser in ways I didn't fully understand yet. I wanted to be in someone's good graces, which made me adjust myself, which really was, this is a bad word. We don't like it as highly sensitive people, which was really a manipulation. I manipulated myself to be more of what I thought the other person wanted me to be. That's not fair to me, and it wasn't fair to anybody I dated back then. That's like a false advertisement. As people pleasers, we can very much believe in a mindless way that that is the right kind thing to do. Be a people pleaser. Be what somebody wants us to be. Use our intuitive powers to become what someone else expects. What a manipulation. To make people like us. I had to look at how I was not authentically showing up as myself. So how the hell could I authentically find a good fit partner? No wonder I was attracting and being attracted to misaligned partners that just kept me in dysfunctional old patterns. This is inner work that's so worth it to know our own patterns. Your patterns may be similar to mine. They may be different. But as human beings, we are undoubtedly and inarguably creatures of pattern. Whether we recognize that pattern or not, we are habitual patterned creatures. If you know your patterns, awesome. You know what you're working to change. Congratulations. We don't have to feel guilty or bad or shame, shame on us when we look at those patterns. We're all imperfect beings just trying to figure it out. Kudos to anybody who is willing to look and shine light in some of those dark corners to figure it out. If you just had an, ooh, what are my patterns? Yikes, I don't know my patterns. I should know my patterns. Don't shoot on yourself. 
good news. You get to discover more of who you are. That is a strengthening of your relationship with yourself. It will help you feel more securely attached than more anxiously attached. You get to learn about your own behaviors, your own attitudes, your own mindsets so that you can craft healthier, more grounded, more rooted, more self worthy and self-respecting behaviors and attitudes and mindsets that can serve versus stifle you. What a gift. What an opportunity. We don't have to feel bad or guilty or broken or messed up. What a beautiful gift to offer yourself in this one precious life and everybody around you who currently loves you and who may love you in the future. Sometimes just brainstorming, just sitting down with good old-fashioned pencil and paper. Brainstorming. How did I show up in past relationships? And allowing your conscious mind and your subconscious mind to hand you some ideas. When we ask, it will be revealed. Ask yourself, how did I show up in past relationships? What are some dynamics of various people you've dated in your past? Allow yourself in a non-emotional way to just observe, like we might observe an animal at a zoo. You're not in the cage, in the danger with the animal. You're just thoughtfully and curiously observing that animal. Observe your past relationships from your end and observe the partners that have come into your space. What similarities do they have? What are the differences there? What do you see when you shine light in those dark corners? You have so much power to work on these patterns and bring yourself to a place of self-respect and self-love. Next tip, know your non-negotiables. We're feelers, y'all. We're touchy, we're feely, we're big-hearted. We love to move through the world, letting our heart navigate. It's beautiful, it's wonderful, but it's not very useful in every single realm. Dating in particular. We've got to know our own non-negotiables. For me, by the time I was dating my now husband, and we are a good match for each other, for me, that was no kids. I wanted to remain child-free. I also knew that I would someday be out there with my story, whether that was memoir or a podcast. I felt that call. Other people I had dated or partnered or even married were not cool with me wanting to be out there that way. Sometimes as feelers, we can get lost in our own feelings and we can let one aspect of an attraction like dreamy eyes or a palpitating heart or a potential dating partner having a very exciting job. We might let these things that spark us, that excite us, that are very interesting to us cloud over our non-negotiables if we don't have a solid understanding and a commitment to honoring those non-negotiables from a place of permission of self-worth that we get to have some non-negotiables. It is your job to have some non-negotiables if nobody's ever said that to you. In any relationship, a work relationship, even this podcasting relationship of you showing up and listening to what I'm spewing into this mic If I start saying things that hit your discernment in an icky way, you are right to have some non-negotiables and stop listening to me or anybody else that hits some of your non-negotiables. Or at least question if you feel an ickiness as someone hits up against what might be some non-negotiables. If you don't think it's right to have a strong relationship with some non-negotiables, I want you to read Melody Beatty's work. Yeah, pretty much everything she's ever put out into the atmosphere, but specifically her book, The New Codependency, which is definitely available on audiobook to those of you that will hit the audiobooks harder than the reading books. Melody Beatty's work on codependency will help you find some permission out of self-respect and self-regard to allow yourself to define who you are, what you're willing to deal with in this life, and what you're not. You are allowed to have non-negotiables, which really is a boundary. There it is. I'm the boundaries teacher. Y'all, I teach it every October. Come sign up if you're interested. Boundaries are the things that get erected 
from our sense of self-worth, self-worth says we get to have limits. We get to have desires. We get to negotiate and we get to have non-negotiables. And it's our job to figure these things out and then honor the boundaries that help us keep the good stuff in and the bad stuff out in reasonable ways. Nobody can have perfect boundaries, but we get to have some, just like we can't have a perfect fence. Any fence, some kind of creature can figure out how to get over. That's not a good reason to not have the fence. Healthy boundaries can be renegotiated healthily at any time. But know there is a huge yet nuanced difference between being invited or even persuaded to reconsider non-negotiables and being pressured, forced, shamed, or manipulated into throwing your boundaries out the window. This is why I'm such a fan of encouraging HSPs and survivors to allow and encourage discernment versus judgment. We must discern the difference between persuasion and manipulation. We must discern a lot in this life, particularly if we come from family dynamics that had a lot of manipulation, a lot of dysfunction, to be able to take care of ourselves. Next tip. Get an elevator pitch that's positive about your trauma history that you share somewhere between dates three and 10. That's as finite as I can get there. And if you wait till date 15, that doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. That's me trying to put some kind of parameter into something that we can't really define. You got to trust your gut about when it's right to share. But my encouragement is to get a healthy, positive elevator pitch about your history. Trauma is not an excuse. I feel like this is a specific and necessary public service announcement that trauma does not excuse bad behavior or reactive behavior or a lifetime of debilitating anxiety. If you want a healthy relationship with someone else, you must learn to have a healthy, good, strong relationship with you. We are like directors in a play, y'all. We hold much power to set the stage. A director can set the stage as a sunny, cloudless spring day in a field of flowers bright with possibility. Or a director can set the stage as a dark, dreary, rainy stage. Behind industrial buildings, creepy figures shuffling through a trash-strewn alley. Self-sabotage happens for a survivor in dating. When they miss the reality of psychology. Because one of the sad realities of our human psychology is that our human egos would rather throw our own selves under the bus than be blindsided by somebody else coming along and all of a sudden throwing us under the bus. So we learn in a faulty, false, failing attempt to self-care, to set the stage like that dark, rainy alley instead of the spring field full of butterflies so that we don't get blindsided. I can meet someone and say, well, nice to meet you. I'm kind of a mess. I'm really screwed up. I'm working on it. But it was very abusive and very dark. It was very rough. I still have a lot of issues. I'm kind of broken. I mean, aren't we all? But yeah, I'm pretty broken. How's that feel as a vibe? To me, that is ER vibes all the way. And it's not attractive. It's detractive. And we do that as if to say, look, this is all my bad stuff. If you're going to want me, you better super want me. I don't want you to reject me because of this bad stuff later. So we've got to understand this with self-compassion while we work to change this relationship with ourselves and our own story. I have just as much power. And no matter how you feel, you have exactly as much power as I do. Feelings don't take away your power. They might trick you into thinking that, but they're wrong. We all have just as much power to pitch ourselves like this. I have come a very long way from my childhood. I'm a seeker. Yeah, I come from a dysfunctional background, but honestly, it has pushed me to get to know myself in deeper, more meaningful, more beautiful ways than I would have otherwise. 
part of how I live is valuing understanding my psychology and leading with more and more compassion and patience for myself and others in the world. I expect and want to be growing and self-developing all the days of my life. And I love that about me. And the right person for me will love that about me too. What's your story? Do you feel the absence of your vibes? Do you feel the self-respect, the self-regard, the utilization of our personal power to lift ourselves up instead of smush ourselves down? Set that stage with bright lights. That's not a lie. The sun is not lying when it comes up just because there also is a darkness in a nighttime. You are not lying when you set the stage with bright lights. Work on that elevator pitch around your history, around your story. You aren't a broken toy. You aren't irreparably damaged. You aren't more darkness than light. Even when the critical voices are trying to convince you that you are nothing but your darkness, they're wrong. You are the light. Just let yourself be. Next tip. This comes from Law of Attraction. You'll recognize it if you're into that. Focused on what you do want and not what you don't want. And don't take it personally. And this is a practice. Don't take it personally if someone is not into you. And don't take it personally and be down on yourself if you aren't into them. Stop giving yourself a hard time. There are billions of people on this planet, y'all. Billions. Can you imagine really how many people that is? Let's normalize disliking each other, which at first might sound very negative, very dark. Like, Nikki, you just said be in the light. What do you mean normalize disliking each other? Y'all, I'm a realist. I'm not a pie in the sky. It's all rainbows and bunnies. I'm a reformed pessimist and a grounded realist who uses positivity as a tool. Positivity isn't about painting in always bright pictures. It's about being real in a way that is positive. It is normal for us to dislike lots of people. Come on, you don't like lots of people. Normalize how we are all looking for someone special when we're dating and special to us. Our spiritual parts can acknowledge that every single person is special in their own way. It doesn't mean that they're our very special person. It doesn't mean that I'm somebody else's very special person. It's not a threat if we are not someone's special person. It can actually be a relief if you let it be. We can meet this energy that the ego names as rejection. What a powerful word, huh? Our egos are like, oh, I was rejected. I rejected them. Like you just hit them with your car. This comes from the, the wound. This comes from the not good enough, the poor me energy. Dating sucks. Negativity, negativity. Nobody's good out there. I'm never going to find my person. That's a downward spiral. We don't need to do that. We can learn to meet this very normal rejection energy that we have to give other people and other people have to give us. We can meet this energy with a reframe that says and sounds like, thank you so much for not wasting my time. May we both meet a very special to us person so very soon and kind of energetically and emotionally high five each other and just get out of there and keep on keeping on. Next dating tip, speak up with courage and be you. We need more clarity with each other and less assumption. Ask questions, but don't interrogate. You hear that nuance? Be honest, but dating is not a strip show. It's a burlesque show, y'all. If you've never seen burlesque live and in person, I strongly encourage you to go see a show. I used to see a burlesque group, I cannot remember its name to save my life, out in New Orleans that was pure comedy and burlesque. It was hilarious. I loved it. So much fun. If pornography is zero mystery, close-up shots of all the goods, burlesque uses feathers and boas and strategic tassels and clothing to playfully cover up and to just show a little tiny bit, 
little bit of playful teasing to show and to leave a little mystery, which builds a desire for more. It's very intriguing. Dating is not porn in this way emotionally. Dating is not stripping down to emotional nudity and showing it all. Dating, it is a burlesque level of nudity emotionally. And to play and have fun with it. All right, next tip. Romance. I want to encourage you to define it or redefine it. Get an adult definition of romance and romantic feeling. Romance and romantic feeling, it's not love bombing or being love bombed. That's when somebody just showers you with gifts and compliments and just is trying to really solidify a bond. It is like a bombing falling out of the sky of love messaging and love messaging and love messaging. It's not real life. The psychology of instant attraction, which so many people confuse with a good reason to start a relationship from instant attraction, because so many of us start dating and allow instant attraction to draw us in as teenagers. The psychology of instant attraction that so many will go to their graves mislabeling and misunderstanding as big L love is really the experience of our inner child. In that instant attraction moment, it's as if our inner child goes, oh, wow, he or she has something missing just like mom or dad. I couldn't get that need met with mom or dad. Maybe I can get my need met from this person. Wow. And that spicy, fiery attraction is so often that. Our old psychology getting us right in that moment. We want to lean into instant intrigue more than fiery instant attraction. Healthy long-term potential feelings grow and build over time. Instant attraction is so often like a fire that burns itself out. Unhealthy attraction from our original family system is at play. And it starts out so promising, that fire sparked and lit, and then it's a disappointing sliding downhill of chaos and stress. And we chase the dragon, like we say heroin users chase the high, chase the dragon. We chase, where did that instant attraction fiery feeling go? It's got to be around here somewhere. It burnt out. And after the fire burns, there's nothing left to relight. If we don't have attachment trauma, my father abandoned me when I was a little girl. I could be the picture of attachment trauma in the dictionary. But if we don't have attachment trauma after the burnout from an instant fiery attraction relationship, we will find our footing. We will stop that slide into chaos and searching for that initial fire. We will walk off to date again and find a new potential partner that's intriguing and possesses the stuff to build a relationship on. Like a house, we need a solid foundation. Instant fiery attraction, ain't it, y'all? If we have attachment trauma, we don't know how to practice resiliency and self-respect right here in this spot. We get triggered in the wound of our worth Because our fear is, oh my gosh, another person going away. I can't deal with it. I can't handle it. But we can't handle it. We get stuck in overthinking and over self-lashing from the critical voice. What did I do wrong? Where is that fire? What's wrong with me? Should I just settle? Are my expectations too high? I'm too weird. I'm too much. I'm too little. And this does nothing positive and only digs the hole of dating despair and low self-worth, deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And that's not the way to get out of it. Instant intrigue. Allow yourself to be intrigued instead of burnt up by the fire. Next dating tip I have for you is a highly sensitive person or survivor. And it's not a very romantic tip. But it, the least romantic tip I have for you is that a true partnership really does at the end of the day 
And after the falling in love phase changes, because we don't stay in that phase always. We go from falling in love to being in love. A true partnership, a true successful long-term relationship, it does in a lot of ways run like a business. When there are problems, they need to be addressed. Like in a business, they will have to be addressed. It's interesting that in relationship, we can sweep so much under the rug. I guess we can in business too, but it'll bite us. And we tend to deal with the tangibles of a business different than the emotions of our relationships. It does as well as highly sensitive people to learn when and where it's exactly right and advantageous for us to be in our feelings, leading from that place, the wisdom that our feelings have for us, but to know the difference between the confusion that our feelings can offer us. If any of us had a real dating education, advisement in school or classes, like most of us took driver's ed to learn how to be safer people on the road and drive those cars. If we had more emotional education in general, we might not get so lost and confused about love and commitment, what it is, what it isn't. We as Westerners, we especially, we have so much programming, y'all, so much Disney princesses, romantic comedies and sitcoms where it all gets tied up so nicely in a little bow in 24 minutes. We are programmed to think and believe that love is a feeling. It's part feeling, sure, but it's so much more than that. Love, long-term love that we're wanting when we're dating. Long-term love that stands the test of time, the stress of life. It's not a constant 100% lovey-doveyness, y'all. Because feelings come and go as easily as feelings of hunger or satiation. We are in constant flux in our thoughts and in our feelings. True love over time is less a feeling and more a commitment that every day we wake up and we are to be each other's support, each other's team member, despite feelings of frustration, of annoyance, of friction, Because we are two fully separate and opinionated human beings with similar and different needs internally and externally, committing to doing the work to negotiate and renegotiate life over and over and over and over and over again. This commitment is love. And the more we embrace the secure attachment to what love really is, Instead of the juvenile, middle school type love programming that Hollywood and media has put into all of us, the paradoxical trick here is that this is how we actually feel. More of the lovey-dovey feeling we really want. That also expands into feeling like security, safety, trust, support, teamwork. And we can exhale into it. It may not sound so lovey-dovey like our emotional parts want or our inner preteen parts dreamed that romantic love might be or even might still believe it should be. My tip, if you choose to take it, because you always have the right to toss it, is to allow dating to be in some ways non-emotional. To be able to look at the realities and ask real questions to get real answers. Like, are we the people we want to grow old with? Are we the people we want to work through the frustrating parts of life with? Do we have the right stuff to partner and come back together again and again and again, despite whatever life throws us individually and together? Are we willing to do the nitty gritty life stuff together? Despite how all of it might feel very much uncomfortable. This is how I define love. As this type of commitment. This secure attachment to coming back to each other over and over and over again. How do you define love? Is it worth re-examining and redefining from this age, from this experience point, from this growth trajectory of what you want for yourself? 
I hope that this episode gave you a more maybe unusual or more nuanced or deeper dating tip or dating strategies than what we can find in any quick Google search of how to date or how to be better at dating. As corny as it sounds, the path to true love is through the true love you cultivate with and for yourself. And that healthy love emanates out, attracting you to good potential matches and attracting good potential matches to you. It's not one directional. It's dual directional. Now, if we ask a whole bunch of psychological or spiritual types, we're going to get a whole bunch of different psychological and spiritual answers to what is love or how to do it. Remember that you are your own authority figure to take what works for you and toss the rest. I am not of the belief that there is one soulmate out there per person. What a scary thought. What a limiting belief. I am of the belief that we have endless potential matches. Those matches are available to help us grow, to shape us. There are infinite possibilities in this life and there are infinite potential partnerships. Some better, some worse, some easier, some harder, but all with lessons. Our power is in choosing while we manage the reality that we're not going to be perfect. A partner's not going to be perfect. Dating's not going to be perfect. Marriage or long-term relationship is going to be far from perfect. I hope you give yourself the time, the space, the respect, and the self-regard to allow your own beliefs, not just to unfold, but to be guided and grown by your hard-earned experience and your collected wisdom as you expand not just your definition of things like love or how you're going to date, but you expand the way that you love yourself. You expand the definitions of all of these things that are so nuanced and not concrete that you expand them into a version that really and truly serves you, serves your inner child, serves your past, and serves and soothes your present. I want to invite you to our next live stream. I want to invite you to try out Patreon because there's a new come try it free for a week feature. Come dip your toe in. Come see how it feels. Come see if it's something that might help you, even if it sits in the background of your life, ready for you to access it when and where you want. I don't use Patreon like Facebook. I'm not constantly just dumping stuff in there just so that there's stuff and content always Every single little thing that we put there, I put a lot of intention into, so does my team. Every little thing in Patreon is a little nugget. If you spend five minutes in there, I want you to be able to walk away going, I got a little bit of something that just adds to my life. Feedback I get the most from all of my work is, wow, I learned something I didn't even know I needed to learn, but wow, did I need to learn it. My work is the type that you just got to kind of stick your toe in and marinate in. On Patreon, we have the biggest discounts on all of my courses. Boundaries are essential to being the person that we deserve to be for ourselves. This life and all the people in it, they will pull at us. They will take. I, I am fascinated by the phrase taking time. If you know that learning about boundaries is exactly what you need, don't overthink it. Don't stress. Just sign up. Show up and marinate. Patreon.com backslash emotional badass. As always, another way to help the show is to write a review. We are all out there in this world trying to figure it out. Anytime you participate in anything that I'm doing out here on this crazy internet, you're goosing whatever algorithms are at play, and you're helping other people find me, the show, and our community at Patreon. Thank you for being the change in the world. And if you're dating, please love yourself through it. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. Be in respect and self-regard of that, and you will find your person. Light and love. I'm an emotional badass. You were an emotional badass. And together, we are where Moxie meets Mindful. 
I'll see you right here next time for a brand new episode. Light and love. Bye-bye.